VGA capture is a difficult topic and something I've been trying to do for about seven years now. Yes, before I started a YouTube channel. I did a video about this last year and detailed some aspects of the problem and how I wanted to solve it. I have some follow-ups to those ideas in that video, but at this point, I've completely changed my methods using totally different hardware. My second attempt of getting a capture system put together became much, much bigger than I initially intended, and I'm going to be making a small series out of it rather than one massively dense video. And today, I want to start with this video as an introduction to how VGA works. It is so much more complicated than you might think and became mired with technical debt as it evolved. And understanding how VGA works can really help in getting better VGA capture, as we'll see later. So I want to start from the ground up and tell you how it was introduced, how it evolved, and what some of the challenging aspects of it are. VGA was a video standard introduced with the IBM PS2 systems in 1987, but there are a few things that stem from this that could be called VGA and it can get confusing. VGA proper is a standard that defines resolutions and an interface protocol. It used a DE15 connector, but this has become known as the VGA connector with accompanying VGA cables. Then you could say that this is a VGA CRT because that is the maximum standard it supports. But later CRTs may only have a DE15 input and still be called VGA while supporting newer standards. So to make this as understandable as possible, I'm going to define my terms right now. VGA means the standard and the 640x480 resolution. VGA interface is the connector and signaling protocol used for the video data. A VGA card or VGA adapter is a graphics adapter for a computer that allows it to output video through a VGA interface. VGA CRTs are those designed only for the original VGA standard, and multi-mode CRTs are those that support more than VGA. I'll address these more as we get into this, but I don't want to get bogged down with pedantics. The VGA interface was designed in a way that made sense for controlling the beam of a CRT, because integrated display logic wasn't common yet. It doesn't take much to control a CRT, so it only has five signal lines. Red, green, and blue video data lines in horizontal and vertical sync signals to synchronize with the display and move the beam. In contrast with its predecessors, EGA and CGA though, VGA is an analog video standard. CGA and EGA had red, green, and blue signals that are on or off with different intensity controls to change the video brightness. The VGA interface outputs different voltage levels to change the color intensity. This decoupled the display's color capabilities from the interface, unlike each previous video standard that required a new monitor when introduced to get full color support. The VGA interface was not limited to a subset of colors and could produce any mixture of red, green, and blue that the connected VGA adapter could generate. The only limiting factor was the capability of that VGA adapter. Original adapters could only display 16 or 256 colors at 4 or 8 bits depending on what they are doing. But it didn't take long for better VGA adapters with larger color varieties to come out and 16 million colors at 24 bit was possible. The analog color choice made displays with a VGA interface both forwards and backwards compatible with all VGA cards. Except not quite. VGA's introduction defined specific resolutions for the video standard. The resolutions were defined as standards with the display interface because CRT monitors needed to be able to sync with the signals. If you provided a video signal beyond what a VGA CRT can match, you will get unexpected and potentially damaging results. We'll get into this more later, but as clone systems became more dominant than IBM's own machines, other companies expanded the VGA interface with new resolutions and sync timings. These were eventually codified as VESA standards that are called modes, but the signals can have more variance than you might expect. This is where the real problem with VGA interface devices happen. I want to visualize the signals, and I'm going to use logic analysis equipment to do this. With this setup, we will be able to see the differences between the VGA interface modes and how they impact signaling in real time. We can see here the separate red, green, and blue video signals at the top, and the horizontal and vertical sync signals at the bottom. First, let's get acquainted with the anatomy of a VGA signal before we start looking at differences. At the beginning of displaying a frame, the video beam of the CRT starts out at the top left and sweeps across to the right, drawing a single line. As it moves off of the visible area of the display, the beam shuts off and a horizontal sync signal is pulsed. This causes the CRT to move the beam back past the left of the display, below the first line, and start moving to the right again. The horizontal pixels only exist for the computer because they are sent as a dynamic analog signal for each color component to the CRT. This analog signal changes as it switches between the pixel values the VGA card has in its video memory. 
So a CRT never has any way of knowing where individual pixels are as this data is lost in the analog signal. This process of drawing horizontal lines is repeated for all vertical lines of the display, but there are actually more non-visible vertical lines in the VGA standard. The rest appear above and below the active video area with the vertical sync. The vertical sync signal happens some blank lines after the last active video line and has a set duration of a number of horizontal signals while the beam moves back to the top of the display. It then waits through more blank lines before starting to draw the next frame of video. These blank areas outside of the video are called the front and back porch, around both sync pulses. The amount and size of the blank area will influence the timing of the video signals. Now the signal I've been showing here is plain VGA 640x480, so let's compare it to SVGA 800x600 and XGA 1024x768 and put some values on the things as we look at them. I don't want to worry about the exact frequencies these are running at because the differences I want to focus on are bigger than that. Immediately we can see that the sync pulses are now flipped or inverted for SVGA compared to VGA. Changing the polarity is used to indicate different modes to a VGA CRT, but is somewhat redundant and became outdated quickly, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. The horizontal sync timings are really tight and are down to pixels at microsecond differences. It's more helpful to compare them relatively than see numbers. I'll still put the values on here from the specifications though, though they may not match these perfectly for reasons we'll get into later. The proportions of the spaces in the horizontal timing like this will change the horizontal position of the viewing area, shifting it left or right, so this is good to know. The vertical sync area has much more variance between the resolutions and is easier to quantify using horizontal lines. VGA has a 10 line front porch, 2 line pulse, and 33 line back porch. SVGA has a 1 line front porch, 4 line pulse, and 23 line back porch. XGA has a 3 line front porch, 6 line pulse, and 29 line back porch. Like with the horizontal timing, differences in these vertical timings will move the visible area up or down. Now overall, with how much the timings differ, coupled with the polarities flipping, there are a lot of things that can change constantly with the VGA interface. There is another problem though. The video standards I showed weren't always respected, especially with earlier games and some hardware. A more innocent example would be some of Apogee's early titles that put some visual data in the porch area around the normally active video frame. For example, Commander Keen's cyan porch areas are outside of the normal resolution and can cause confusion about the actual resolution of the active video not matching the timings in later displays. But there are some examples like Jazz Jackrabbit that eschew the standards and have issues like completely different horizontal timing. This causes it to be shifted to the right and can make it difficult or impossible to see the entire frame in some cases. One more example would be the Voodoo 2 in my tiny Pentium system. When that is outputting VGA 640x480, it has too many lines in the vertical front porch shifting the image up, but it only gets better because the Voodoo 2 only becomes active when in use. That means the vertical timing will change when switching between the 2D and 3D cards in the system even if they're outputting the same resolution. These are the types of weird non-standard things you can expect from this era. CRTs were for the most part capable of handling these discrepancies because of their forgiving analog nature, but as more video signal timing standards and displays were introduced, this became more complicated and things started to change. As VESA standards were widely adopted, CRTs needed to get a bit smarter and started including logic for adjusting to match the signals that they were sent. These CRTs are known as multi-mode or multi-sync because they can synchronize with many different signals. This also brought with it EDID, which added an I2C based communication between the display and VGA adapter to negotiate what resolutions the display could handle. Feeding an unsupported resolution into these multi-mode CRTs should have a display an error rather than messily fail to sync like pure VGA CRTs would. Still, being CRTs, as long as they could accept the strange variety of sync signals, they could show an image without any issue. But then came along LCDs. Unlike CRTs, LCDs have a finite resolution in the display area and are crucially digital, requiring the analog signal to be reconverted back into a full video frame before it can be displayed. And it isn't as easy to align an analog signal to the grid of LCD pixels as it is the open glass on a tube. As a result, LCDs rely heavily on the VESA standards being followed and can still have issues with properly locking onto a signal. Frequently, you will have areas cut off or misaligned and especially with poorly behaving hardware or software. DVI and HDMI don't suffer from this because they deal directly with pixel information rather than trying to control an analog device. That's why you don't really see any functions to adjust video size and position for digital inputs, and why HDMI overscan is stupid. 
but they're needed for VGA interfaces. It also takes slightly longer for LCDs to adjust to different video signals over VGA. CRTs had no issue with this. Once they resync, they can start moving the beam around, but LCDs need to resync and then realign the pixels to their internal frame buffer. This isn't really a fault of LCDs, it's just the nature of the analog to digital conversion process. But because multi-mode CRTs were by far the standard until the 2000s, software didn't need to worry about changing resolutions, and it wasn't uncommon for it to happen when playing a game during some actions, like opening menus. So using LCDs for VGA can come with a few annoyances. Now, I said we weren't going to talk about frequencies, but there's one more thing that I think is worth knowing about. The vertical refresh rate. Televisions almost always used a fixed vertical refresh rate matching the main's power frequency, around 60 Hz for NTSC and 50 Hz for PAL as examples. PC monitors, though, have used a ton of different refresh rates. 50, 60, and 70 Hz were all common before Windows was ever released. These weren't things you could adjust either. The VGA standard for 640x480 was fixed at 60 Hz, and VGA CRTs could only handle that refresh rate at that resolution. But it wasn't a limitation of the vertical sync, it was actually because of the horizontal sync. VGA CRTs have a fixed horizontal sync frequency a little over 31 kHz. This is the amount of times a second a new line is drawn to the screen. We can even calculate this, since we know that 640x480 has 525 lines total if you add the vertical porches and sync pulse while drawing a new frame at 60 times a second. If we multiply those numbers together, we get 31,500 or 31.5 kilohertz. Now, an interesting thing about the fixed frequency VGA CRTs is that for the most part, it's only the horizontal frequency that matters. If you can output a different resolution at the same horizontal frequency, the monitor will accept and display it. And this is exactly how the 70 Hz 720x400 mode that DOS uses works. If we do the same math of multiplying the full number of lines, 449 in this case, by the 70 Hz refresh rate, it comes out to 31,430, or 31.4 kilohertz, and that is close enough for a VGA CRT to sync to. Older games would frequently run at a lower resolution so that they could perform better, and this usually meant dropping to 720x400 mode and using a 320x200 video frame, but this also meant that they ran at 70 hertz. Now when multi-mode CRTs came out, their primary selling point was that they supported different horizontal sync frequencies, and even fully variable support was eventually possible, which allowed arbitrary resolutions and refresh rates to be used. Within some sane limits, of course. LCDs, by contrast, have a different problem though, because they typically run at a fixed 60Hz vertical refresh rate for the panel. They will usually accept a 70Hz signal, but they will likely have to drop frames as they display it, which may not be desirable. Okay, I think that's enough about VGA for now. That covers a lot of the basics that we'll need for the next section on actually capturing VGA from a computer. But for those of you who may not care about VGA capture or are only watching this out of interest for VGA, let me answer a few more potential questions. How do I know if a CRT is multi-mode? Well, SVGA came out one year after VGA. There was such a short lifespan of pure VGA CRTs that almost all of the VGA interface CRTs you find will be multi-mode. There are varying levels of multi-mode support, but pretty much all of them will go up to 1024 by 768 and be good enough for average use for games. If you really want to be sure though, if it has buttons or any kind of on-screen display, it's basically guaranteed to be multi-mode. Do I need a pure VGA CRT? Definitely not. Any multi-mode display can sync to anything that a VGA CRT can, and VGA CRTs mostly fall into two categories, old and cheap. Unless they have some other quality that gives you a reason to use one, you're better off avoiding them since they can potentially be damaged by sending them the wrong signal. And just to get ahead of it, they aren't any faster or have a lower response time either. All typical VGA interface CRTs, multi-mode or not, are direct analog devices with no delays. What about the pixel clock? This is the measurement of time between pixels and the analog signal. It's kind of a thing that doesn't actually matter outside of the VGA adapter, and maybe for some LCDs. But even for video capture, I'm not that worried about what the pixel clock is. If you're making a VGA adapter, then it will matter a lot more. The only thing you should really know is that the signal is very fast at dozens or hundreds of megahertz, and if there are poorly behaving components in the circuit, you could see bleeding or other types of interference because of it. What about high refresh rate CRTs? 
there are some multi-mode CRTs that can do bananas high speed frame rates, and it is cool to see in person, but the VGA interface is really bad at high speed data and interference protection. 1024 by 768 at A5 Hz has a pixel clock around 95 megahertz. That's right in the middle of FM radio. 1600 by 1200 at 100 Hz is around 280 megahertz. That's higher than what a Cat6 cable used for 10 gigabit ethernet is rated for. There are a lot of potential interference sources at these high speeds that can significantly reduce the image quality, and most VGA cables probably aren't rated for frequencies that high. So yeah, there are some multi-mode CRTs that can go up to super high refresh rates, but there will likely be video degradation if you run them that fast, and it may not be worth it. Hopefully that answers most of the questions you might have about VGA. Stay tuned for the next video where I will go over how I'm doing VGA capture now and what hardware I will be recommending for it. And as a teaser, I've tested a number of different solutions now. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to subscribe for the next one. And if you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I'll see you next time.